Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Institute of Documentary Film. My name is Hanna Kulhankova, and I'm a coordinator of the IDF industry sessions, which bring you online discussions, lectures, and masterclasses every other week. Today's session uh, will be about uh, film PR and marketing without meeting people. And apart from the general information, we will learn how it was to do PR and marketing strategies for two great documentary films that just came out during the pandemic. One of them is Ecstasy, which premiered at CPH Docs, and the other one is Nothing But The Sun, which was an opening film at ITFA Festival. Uh, both are really, really great films, and I recommend to everyone to watch them. We have uh, great speakers today and uh, uh, who are ready to answer all the questions that come to your mind, so don't forget to write in the chat your questions. And now I would like to introduce the moderator of the evening, Sean Farnell who has been doing many different positions within the documentary industry and nowadays is also a production marketing and distribution uh, consultant. So he, has all, so he has lots of knowledge about our topic. Sean, screen is yours. And to all of you, enjoy the discussion. Have a great evening and don't forget to ask mm. questions. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Hannah, and thanks to uh, IDF. Uh, for organizing this session, which is hopefully of, uh, of use to all you out there. And um, um, soon I'm going to welcome our, our three guests and to talk a, a little bit about themselves and what they're up to. Um, of course, we all know uh, the situation, um, uh, both what's unique to these times and what's constant. Um, thousands of creative and point of view documentaries being released each year uh, through film festivals. Thousands more not making it, uh, um, lots of films out there. Um, um, uh, it's an economy of attention, uh, an economy in which uh, the kinds of productions we all love, these creative and, and point of view documentaries, uh, do not have as much capital as um, uh, some of the other uh, forms um, that audiences have to choose from. Thousands of films, hundreds of film festivals, fewer distributors, um, fewer places to exhibit, and lots of choices uh, for audiences. So um, our three guests today from their various points of view are going to uh, talk about the strategies uh, they use to try to get attention on, on, on this work that we all love. Um, um, I'm coming from, uh, as Hannah mentioned, a more varied uh, background. I spent the, my, what I call my first uh, career as a film festival programmer at the Toronto Film Festival and then at Hot Docs here in Toronto where I am. And um, then more recently, I've been working with independent filmmakers and producers and sometimes organizations on how to figure out this very complicated back end to get uh, these productions out into the world and to eventually land with audiences. And so I work on uh, marketing, on sales, uh, on festivals, et cetera both as a consulting consultant as a, and a consulting producer. Um, it's great that we have three different sort of points of view here too. We have uh, a filmmaker, uh, 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 Moira, who um, premiered uh, her work, as Hannah mentioned, at CPH Docs earlier this year. Uh, one of the, well, the really first documentary festival to have to ver pivot very, very quickly to the uh, virtual scenario, which we're, we're now seeing played out across the festival landscape. Um, we have, uh, and Moira is joining us from Sao Paulo uh, today. Uh, uh, you may hear roosters in the background. She's in the countryside, apparently. Uh, we have uh, Xavier uh, of Film Republic uh, coming to us, uh, yes, from the marketing point of view, but, but specifically sales. So marketing to the industry, which is what sales is. And uh, Miriam uh, uh, focusing on publicity and marketing across a, a number of documentary productions, in, including the two we're going to discuss today. So just to get everyone to say hello here, uh, Mara, tell us a little bit about uh, uh, yourself, uh, what you're up to, how you've been managing these days. Uh, sure. So first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank, thank you, everyone that's watching. Uh, I'm Mara Passoni. I'm a filmmaker from Brazil. I live in between New York City and Sao Paulo and New York City. I'm finishing an MFA on writing directing at Columbia University. 
And I've spent like the last few years uh, co-writing and associate producing The Edge of Democracy. It's a feature with Petra Costa and Making Ecstasy. Uh, that's a documentary that, that Sean just told us about. And what I should say about myself, maybe just like I'm a incredible, curious, curious person and very passionate one. Uh, and also I think like this pandemic about to say something about the pandemics, it's been of course like a very challenging time, but also a great opportunity uh, to think about several things and also almost like reinventing my epistemology and the way I relate to the world and what are the important questions right now. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Xavier, now I'll go to you, you're in London. Hi, yeah, so we uh, at Film Republic, we work on what we call director-driven or art house uh, documentaries and fiction. Um, on our lineup, we uh, right now we're working on a films like 512 Hours with Marina Abramovich and Nothing But The Sun, the it for opener. Um, and, you know, we look for great storytelling and uh, films with cinematic value. And, you know, this year has been, I'll echo the words of Maura, with, there's been loads of opportunities this year. And, you know, like the, uh, the World Trade Organization, they launched a campaign called The Great Reset. And actually, I think this year offers, offers loads of opportunities to reset the way we're releasing films. So I look forward to sharing some of that. Thanks. Thanks, Xavier. Uh, Miriam, uh, coming to us from Berlin, you can tell us a little bit about you, your company, how you're managing these days, and maybe set up the two films that we're going to be focusing a little bit on today. Yeah. Hi, Sean. Thanks for the um, brief introduction. So, yeah, my name is Miriam. I uh, run a company called Noise Film PR, and I've been doing film PR campaigns for the last 12 years, roughly. Um, and even though we also handle sort of theatrical releases, my main focus really is um, on releasing films on international, at international film festivals. And a lot of the work that I do is related to documentaries. And mostly that means getting the film seen by as many people as possible, but also by the right people. Um, so really making sure that your film hits the audience that you want to hit. Um, but there's also a lot in sort of guiding the filmmakers through the festival and the preparations. Um, how do you deal with press? How do you position the film? Um, I think these are all topics that we're gonna be um, discussing as well. And I mean, I've been happy to work with the other panelists here over the last few months. And um, so I think we might be able to watch a um, short teaser for Ecstasy, which was in the main competition of CPH Doc. So let's have a look at that teaser first. Ela tinha 15 anos e as pessoas lhe perguntavam se ela queria ser maratonista. As pessoas lhe perguntavam muitas coisas. Mas para ela, não interessava nem as perguntas e nem as pessoas. A paciente Clara foi encontrada com rebaixamento de nível de consciência torporosa, 29 quilos, Mas eu tento desejar, eu desejo. E agora?
Hey, uh, great. It's a beautiful uh, film and, 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 uh, and uh, also uh, intense and, and, and tough. And I know uh, personal and um, uh, ecstasy premiered at CPH Docs. Mauro, I'll just ask you first, um, at what point did you engage with Miriam around the publicity and how did you think through, okay, how I'm going to set up this sort of infrastructure around uh, my film? Uh, uh, maybe you can just uh, talk about that first. Yeah, sure. Uh, we were about like, I think we, we got together the first time like a month from CPH Docs, right? Uh, or maybe like me, maybe as soon as we decided uh, to go to CPH Docs, like when we like accepted the invitation. Uh, and then like the most important call we had because everyone was ready to uh, travel to CPH Docs. Um, and the, first, the, the very important moment for us was when we got together into a call and that was Mirjan uh, Alexander from Sindicato, that is the sales agent, Sarah Dosa, who is our co-producer, Margot Mars, who is uh, a consultant producer, and also Mariana Oliva, who is a, a, an associate producer. And we, we started discussing what should we do? Uh, like that was the first festival going virtual we, we had no information about the COVID, so the, the pandemics, so we could not predict. Some people was imagining, like some people were imagining it's gonna take like one month. Other people were telling us it's gonna take a year. Uh, and then like we put together like several pros and co and con and cos and con, con like cons. Uh, and I think like, of course, one thing, uh, of course, it's way more powerful when you meet people in real life and it facilitates connections, exchanges, and even make, makes business easier. And of course, the film in a theater is, as I see that, is way more powerful. Uh, and it's completely different watching that on a laptop and in a theater, uh, on a laptop that you are really like, distracted all the time with internet and other people and you're not in the in this dark room and, and big screen uh, and also because uh, in the case of ecstasy it's a very intimate film uh, and they like we did a screening when we are like in the last cut like about to close the film we did a screening with Fernando Epstein who is my editor and also uh, a writer for the film uh, we were editing in Montevideo and we put together a screening because we wanted to, to feel a little bit what the film would provoke on people that had no idea about the film. And that was quite, quite powerful. And one of the, the, the elements of that was it's such an intimate film that watching around other people, it like really brings up several questions uh, and makes the experience very different. And also, of course, it's a very sensorial film the sound plays an important role in the film, whole role in the film. So of course the experience in the laptop changes that a lot and somehow you lose that like that thing. And also some of the shots in the, in the film, they are there because, like thinking on the big screen because there is also a, a play, like we play a lot of scale and very close shots and wide shots and, and Again, of course, this, this experience in the theater is different. Uh, and even me, like as a director, I've spent, I don't know, so many years to make this film. And I was like, oh, okay, finally, it's gonna become real. It's gonna screen uh, this very virtual experience, the Durio's experience at Anorexia is gonna have some kind of physicality in a theater. And no, it's not like, uh, and it's curious because the character in the film is isolated from the world and she's also, uh, immersed in a very virtual world. And that was the first thing that I thought, okay, maybe it's a very good idea to, to, to indeed like go to CPH right now. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking right now as a, a director, of course. Uh, and, and there is another point that's also important. Uh, I don't think nowadays we can have this privilege of thinking about films that go to theater and films that go to streaming. Because I mean, by one hand, streaming like the experience is less intense, by, but by the other hand, 
it allows much more people in different places of the world to watch our film. So there is a potential, democ like it's more democratic in a certain way, even if like there's another discussion about how do you promote the marketing around that? Because of course, releasing a film is a coalition of forces. And even like on streaming, like if you wanna have an impact or change a conversation about a subject, you need to create those alliances. Mm -hmm. uh, so and and um, well, I just I just ask you to pause there. Um, okay, sorry. Yes, sorry. Well, obviously, as a filmmaker, you want the best kind of attention, the highest quality of kind of attention, especially for a work like this that is is so visually um, uh, uh, complex. And, um, and, and as you mentioned, the sound, and, and when you're in a cinema, you know, you have them for the whole time, uh, most of the time. Um, and you have that kind of attention. And that's how, you know, even though eventually if it's on broadcast or if it's on um, VOD, you know, that's where films land, obviously, in the end. But that initial attention is, is so important. And this is, of course, the big thing that we've lost. Um, and, and not just the attention of the audience is, of course, the same kind of attention for the, from the market when we're all in that bubble together watching and discussing films. Um, did you, you, you mentioned pros and cons. I'm going to go to, to you, Miriam, in a second, but you mentioned pros and cons. What were, uh, just sort of very briefly, uh, did you ever, did you seriously can think, no, I'm just going to, we're just going to put this back in our pocket uh, for a while and wait this out? Like how close were you to not doing, for instance, your festival launch in this, in this environment? Yeah, I think I was more conflicted internally than like on the decision of uh, of accepting the, like going to CPH, uh, and and also because I don't know we didn't know if the festivals would like start again in the second semester and probably we would have to like compete. We would be in the middle of a huge production that's made being made this year and also several films that are in post-production, other films about the COVID crisis and etc. So that was also an element about, okay, if you're starting everything next year, does it make sense or not? Uh, and like, I think uh, the big element uh, for me as a director was um, the, the subject somehow is becoming each time more important. Mm -hmm. It's more contemporary. Maybe it's, it's, it makes more sense in the world as it is right now than uh, eight years ago. And so I you felt there was some kind of urgency now to have the film out and in, in, in the world, uh, regardless of the circumstances. Um, yes. I'm just going over to you, Miriam. So, you know, I, I assume this is sort of more or less typical when a filmmaker or a producer gets in touch with you at the point at which they're invited for their festival premiere. Is that more typical? Do you usually engage earlier? Um, um, uh, tell us a little bit about the point at which you're, you're first getting in touch with your clients. Yeah, no, that's about right. So, I mean, there are some teams or some, some partners that we've been working on um, for a longer time of which I know certain sales agents or producers that will tell me like, oh, we have a film coming up and we're sending it to CPH or we're sending it to Cannes or Locarno. Um, but usually like the actual confirmation we will get um, at the moment where a film is accepted to a festival, which is when we start doing our work. So you have a month now. That's very, that's, you know, a very small window to get everything ready. Tell us a little bit about how those first conversations maybe uh, here with uh, Maura and, and her team and, and like what happens? Uh, the filmmaker comes to you. I have this invitation. What are the first things, uh, kind of what's your checklist to get started there? Yeah, I think, um, I don't quite remember. I think with um, Ecstasy, it was the producer who contacted me. I think it was Sarah Dosa who contacted me about the film. And um, the first step for me is to watch the film. Um, because also because we are a smaller company, so I really want to feel that I can support the film with everything that I have in me, and I really, really want to get be able to get behind the film. Um, so the first thing is to watch the film, and then pretty soon after, a call followed with um, I think Sarah and uh, Margot and Mora, where we discussed the objectives of the festival. And again, with this film, it's the most unique case in my career is where, when we were talking, this was, I was thinking, I think mid or early February, maybe, where we didn't even realize it 
COVID was going to hit us as much in Europe. And so we would talk about objectives and, and it is really different if you want to, um, like if you're going to start a PR campaign, do you want to really establish a filmmaker as an up and coming talent? Do you want to position the film in a certain way? Do you want to get as many sales as possible? Do you want to get sales in a certain territory? So we would focus on press from a specific territory. Do you want to um, fill the cinema? So is it going to be more of an audience campaign? Do you want to involve organizations? So it's going to be more of an impact outreach campaign. And these are all questions that we will discuss in that first talk. And from there on, we will start sort of mapping the whole campaign. And I think with what, what happened with ecstasy was that it's that all shifted sort of halfway. And I think we were all really underestimating the COVID situation. Whereas I think until like a week before, we were all saying, oh yeah, we're gonna go. If we can travel, we will travel. And then the closer we got to the festival, the more we realized like, this is not gonna happen. This is not gonna be a physical screening. And we, we had to adapt really, really quickly. Um, and I think it went from like your initial reaction of no, no, but we, people need to see this film in the cinema to yeah, a very practical thing. And I think we quite quickly decided like this might actually be a sort of opportunity for the film. And I think because it was so new for everybody, I think that this, the discussion was really open. So also with press, with the whole team, it just meant a lot and lot of communication really with each other. Yeah, that was a crazy time. I mean, I was working on the Frank Zappa documentary. We were to premiere at South by Southwest and then CPH. We had travel booked. We had the materials. We had everything in place. And then, bang, we pulled out of both in that case. And, and we launched in the fall. But intense, intense time. Um, okay, so, um, you know, you start talking and assessing the goals, uh, obviously making the adjustments to this unique time. How much are you getting involved with the early materials, rewriting the, rewriting this, or looking at the synopsis, looking at the artwork? Are they coming to you with those materials? Are you creating them from scratch at that point? Just maybe using this as a, a specific example. How do you, how much of a role do you play in, in shaping how those materials are, are constructed? So with access, I mean, we were all a bit last minute with this film, I think. So I think all the material, sort of visuals were still being worked on. But I do remember that we really worked on getting a good synopsis in place for the film because it's such an intimate and sensitive story. And it's such, such a delicate film that you really want to position it in the right way. So once we start reaching out to press, we want a text that really reflects not only what the film is, but also what we want the film to sort of radiate. Um, so in this case, we did rewrite the synopsis. Um, and I think we worked on the press book as well. So we made the press kit uh, with a director statement. So me and Maura went back and forth on the director statement, which I think took quite some versions because we really, really wanted to get it right on, on what more I wanted to do with this film as well. So we actually worked on that all within that one month time frame. Wow, and are you also getting the digital stuff set up, uh, the social media? I, 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 I'm not sure if you did social media. I, I couldn't really find any. Is that a, something that's a priority for you at, at the festival from here, having your Facebook page, Instagram, maybe TikTok now, your, your website, et cetera? I mean, it's. Be, I would say that's definitely something that has changed in the last few months, that it's become even more relevant. But we didn't do that for Ecstasy. But uh, with Nothing But The Sun, the other film we will discuss in a bit, we did do that. Um, yeah. And we did set that up. Yeah, okay. So let's, uh, let's come back to Ecstasy a, a little bit. And I want to walk through the actual premiere. Uh, get, but let's get to Nothing But The Sun, which is the other production to, to fold in here. Um, and then, uh, Xavier, I can get you into the discussion here as well. You're uh, doing the sales on this film. Um, um, so uh, perhaps back there at Master Control, Xavier, tell us a little bit about Nothing But The Sun. And then uh, we'll have uh, the folks at IDF run the trailer of that film for us, if, if that's OK. Sure. Um, so Nothing But The Sun is the second feature by Arami Ulon, who did El Tiempo Nublado a few years ago, which was a big festival hit and uh, it tells the story of um, Mateo and an indigenous um, 
Ayoreo, one of the native uh, people of um, Paraguay, who's been led off the land by the white settler. And he's, uh, he's filmed recording the, the legacy of his people and recounting the memories. So it's, um, you know, he's it, trying to keep his legacy and story alive, but it's also a big reflection on our modern way of living in the West. And it's a deeply uh, troubling and emotional documentary, which uh, we were very pleased to launch as the opening film in ITVA this year. Yeah, obviously a great slot. We can get back a little bit about how yeah. that's different. Um, uh, let's uh, give our audience a little taste of Nothing But The Sun. Uh, we'll see, the, I think, the trailer now. Yo ね、Obviously, another film that can only benefit from the uh, attention uh, uh, that we could give it in the cinema, both uh, with the imagery, the tone, the kind of quiet tone of, of the film. Um, Xavier, uh, when did you get involved in the production? Tell us a little bit about that and then how you engage with Miriam, uh, um, a little oh. bit about the timelines. Yeah, well, we'd worked on um, Arami's first feature, who was also, uh, which was also produced by the same producer, Pascal uh, from Cineworks. So we'd been following the project since uh, the last two and a half years, uh, since its inception and early development. Uh, although officially we only boarded the project uh, a few weeks before the festival launch, but we'd been involved with supporting the, the funding applications. And you know, it's a very execution driven feature. So you know, it evolved heavily, including uh, twice in the editing room uh, to finalize the structure and sort of narrative storyline. Would the, um, let's talk a little, I mean, just, and I'm going to go to you, Maura, too. The first thing is um, figuring out the premiere. Uh, uh, Maura, was CPH your first choice? Had you been submitting to other festivals uh, prior to that? Uh, yeah, I was submitted, submitted to Sundance, uh, sorry, to, to Berlin Film Festival. And okay. we were like waiting to the very last moment about the decision. And also yeah, we had another invitation and we, we understood like we, we were not selected to Berlinale. Then uh, we, we really understood CPH would be the, the best place 
yeah, I, I agree with that choice. Um, Xavier, same was, uh, did uh, you were feeling out other festivals, maybe Venice uh, earlier, maybe even earlier can uh, tell us a little uh, well, bit about that. The film was literally fresh out the edit suite, I think maybe a day before the launch. It was really, um, you know, it was a combination of timing of the festival. It hadn't really been sent out to many and it was always one of the key, uh, you know, one of the king festivals that was targeted. So it was a combination of target festival and uh, and good timing. Right. Um, yeah. How 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 far in advance? Tell us a little bit about like the opening night slot. You get the invitation, and then oh, we're gonna do opening, or does it all come at once? You're invited to open. Tell us a little bit about the timing of that. <laughs> um, you know, it is like I, I call it the magic wand of um, you know, the festival selections are really key in, uh, in promoting a film and selling it. And for documentaries, it for competition is really one of the key ones. Um, I believe, I could be mistaken, but I believe the competition invite came before the opening invite. Um, it wasn't, uh, they weren't all timed at the same time, but um, you know, I mean, it's an amazing section. So, you know, I'm not gonna, uh, underrate its impact on the profile of a film like this. You know, it's mm -hmm. a very delicate feature, as you saw by the trailer. And, um, you know, it, it is a taste uh, maker. So it does drive a lot of attention from the, the broadcasters, from the SVOT, mm -hmm. that, you know, quite unfortunately, quite frankly, uh, wouldn't happen in the same way had it not uh, had, you know, a key slot from a key festival. And, and this yeah. is really the key. If it doesn't get yeah. that slot, do you not get involved? Uh, well, you know, we, we have a, we had a history with the, with the producer and the filmmaker. We, I think we've worked on now, it's our third film with uh, Pascal and second with Arami. So we did, I mean, we did have an unwritten agreement that we'd work on it. Um, you know, unfortunately, some companies will drop films. Uh, we, we don't do that. If you see a film on our lineup, you know, we'll stick with it, even if it doesn't do a big launch. But, you know, the reality is the value is from getting into, you know, we do fiction also. So if you get into one of the top five festivals, the sales value is maybe 10 times higher. And so, you know, for some sales companies who have a bigger team, five, 10 people who have to meet the bottom line on a commission, uh, they will drop films. And it's, it's a commercial decision, but not every film can be sold purely because the commission might not cover the expenses. Um, so, you know, yeah. it does, it does affect, it does affect uh, decisions, unfortunately. Speaking to, uh, you know, leverage that, uh, that such an invitation gives, gives to a film in the competition. Yeah. Um, at what point do you then engage Miriam? We're talking maybe a, a month, six weeks out of the festival, you figure out that you're not just in the competition that you've been opening night. Uh, when, hmm. does, when does Miriam get involved? Oh, we spoke within, um, you know, a few days of knowing uh, the selection. I, I referred, well, I think many people referred Miriam, including me. Um, yeah. She came with accolades and high stars. Um, so, yeah, no, we, we discussed with the producer, but I think that there was, again, an unwritten agreement that we were going to try to bring Miriam on board. And um, we'd worked previously on uh, another feature together. And then we outlined together the whole uh, target, like Mira mentioned. So, you know, who we're going to target was going to be industry, was going to be public, was it going to be Dutch press, international press, which territories. And, um, you know, it's, it's a key thing because, you know, producers need to need to agree on what the, the PR process is going to be. Is it going to be for just getting a key uh, trade reviews? Is it going to be for the wider press, including you know, blogs and smaller ones? Is it going to, you know, in the good old day, is it going to include things like protocol? So the photo call, the press uh, junket, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and those were things we had to discuss uh, in a very short amount of time. And Miriam, over to you then, not just, uh, the film's just not invited to premiere, have its world premiere, but it's the opening night film. How does that change your approach? Does it, what other factors do you have to consider given the prestige of that slot? And of course, the awareness it generates. Well, it, it definitely makes my work a lot easier if it's the opening film, because 
I mean, automatically you're going to be having a lot more eyes on you. Um, mm. And people will sort of like, they will start planning the festival coverage from the opening film. And then luckily we had the combination of both the opening film and the film being in the main competition. So that was really, really helpful. Um, and I knew it from the start. So I think I got the call from Pascal maybe two days after um, you heard that it was going to be the opening film. So yeah, I got the call saying, hey, we've got the opening film for ITFA. Are you interested? Um, which is, of course, a really nice call to get. No, thank you. You're like, no, thanks. I'm busy. How many, yeah. <laughs> films, how, how many films did you have in ITFA? Because often I know people who do uh, what you do are juggling a number of films. How do you... Uh, how many did you have this year representing? Yeah, we had five films that it for this mm -hmm. year. Wow, that's a lot. So you were, uh, yeah. it's been a busy time for you then. Um, okay, it so- is. It uh, is traditionally, but yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about then um, those first actions you take, uh, both uh, Miriam with um, uh, getting attention on the film. Are you sending out screeners? What are the rules of engagement there? Then Xavier, I'm going to go to you the same. And how are you positioning sales? Who are you sending? Though? Tell me a little bit about how you make your priorities. So Miriam, first with you about how do you figure out the press strategy, who you're going to send to, who you're going to wait, etc. How does that work? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it all starts with, with the call, I would say again, the team call where we lay out the um, sort of the goals of the campaign. And it, it's, I would say it's already very different if there is a sales agent on board or not. So if there is a sales agent on board, which was the case with both of these films, um, it means that you work really, really closely together with the sales agents to see, um, to really think about the future of the film. So really think about if this film is gonna have a life after this festival, what are we gonna have to do? to um, get it there. And our first step will be really basically just to send out a press release. So as soon as we know that we're on board of a film, we send out the press release. The problem you might encounter though there is that the festival itself hasn't announced it yet. So I think with, um, so with Ecstasy, we knew quite early on that the film was gonna be in competition. So we could communicate pretty quickly that the film was going to be in the main competition but with nothing but the sun we had to wait about like a good two weeks two and a half weeks i would say before the festival which is really really a very short time window for me to actually get in touch with press so what we do do is sort of under embargo contact key press so we will identify certain journalists that we know are either um, covering that fest specific festival or that are covering documentaries specifically or that are going to be interested in a um, the topic of the film. So we really try to think who will this film match with really mm -hmm. and, and reach out to them and also really make sure that, and I think especially with documentaries, sending out screeners I think is essential in getting your coverage. And it might, it might be a bit less essential for a purely documentary film festival. But if, for example, you have a documentary playing in Berlin, you, it's very, very easy that you'll sort of drown in that whole sea of fiction film. So the more you can give people access to your film before the festival even starts, um, the more chances you get of actually getting that coverage. And I mean, this is all based on trust, of course, and of, on this relationship that we have built with journalists over the years. So we would never send out a screener in the press release, for example. I wouldn't just send it to anybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I would really talk to some of the critics, ask them if they already know whether or not they will get a reviews commission for a certain festival, if they're going to be attending um, even before that press list has been published, I would say. So there's a lot of sort of going back and forth with the critics, with the chief critics, um, because of course, every, that's the thing everybody's always talking about, right? Everybody always wants the reviews in the trades. So Screen, Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Indie Wire, those are always sort of the main focus for a lot of people. And those are people that we will send a screener um, in advance. And it's always a scary thing, I think, to do for a filmmaker to really know that people 
I mean, it's changed now, but you, you are sure that people are going to watch it at home on their laptop. And I do mm. know that certain journalists will have, they have like a good screen at home or they have a very, very big TV that they can watch it on. But it's very scary to send your film as a Vimeo link to a very influential um, critic that might mm. sort of be the person to make or break your the future of that film. Um, yeah, I, I must say, yeah, I, I, I do believe that if you're a documentary filmmaker and if you are relatively new, well, relatively yeah, new filmmaker, I, I don't think any of the trades will really destroy you. They will probably just not publish, but um, there is, there's a lot of pressure on it. Um, and that's, that's a scary, scary moment, yeah. Yeah, we all will look at the, our Vimeo back end and look, did they watch it all the way through? Uh, what's going on here? Um, what are your uh, sort of top five? I mean, I'm, I imagine at this point you're focusing mainly on industry and trade media. Um, what are your kind of top five hits? You know, we, we've got to get three of these five. What, we all know them probably, but just what would be your top five? What yeah, so I would, oh, in terms of press, you mean? Like yeah. media. Yeah, what do you want to get? Um, I mean, you want to get at least one review in either screen variety, The Hollywood Reporter, I would say. If you get more, then even better. Um, I would say for documentaries at doc festivals, those are the more realistic ones. Um, you have Filmmaker Magazine, who, for example, for Mora has been a great support, uh, who named to one of the tw 25 more, I think. Fa new faces in independent filmmaking um, after ecstasy. So Filmmaker Magazine is quite big. I think in Europe, Cineuropa is um, a platform that covers a lot. Business Doc Europe is doing a lot. Um, I think those are like the main, like the basic things that you want to get um, and that we're aiming for. I mean, it's always difficult to give a guarantee, but those are the ones that at least we're aiming for. And who do you say no to? You're going to have to wait. I would say, I mean, it depends on the filmmaker as well. So if a filmmaker says, oh, this like there's specific kind of press I, I really don't like. Or, for example, if we know, let's say if you know that in two months time, the festival, the film is going to a festival in Italy. So then you might hold off Italian press. Mm -hmm. um, because you don't want them to publish now because they, they will not publish again in two months. Um, so you might not not contact them, but you will ask them kindly to hold up their publication, um, which very often they do. So, for example, um, we worked on Milo Rao's The New Gospel in Venice this year, which is a Swiss film. And obviously um, the Swiss press was really interested in the film. But the film is also going to be uh, distributed in Switzerland from December 17. So we didn't want all that Swiss publicity to come out in September already. So you sort of negotiate with those media to hold off. So I would say it's more sort of, it more depends on geographical assets of those media. And of course, I mean, some, and that's, I think that's more of, um, of a fiction film thing though, but like, tabloids or any kind of um yeah. those kind of magazines some some actors like it some don't um, mm -hmm. yeah xavier the same kind of question for you in terms of the first reviews of the film what kind of things you got to think about from the sales point of view you know for example if you're going to do theatrical territorial sales you don't want as miriam said you know, those consumer publications during reviews out of a festival because you want them to review the theatrical release. What kind of things you think about and try to protect from the sales point of view from those early reviews? Yeah, sure. I mean, to be honest, um, trade publications like the ones Miriam mentioned aren't really, you know, they're, they're targeted to industry and, uh, and filmmakers and festivals. They're not really wider, you know, wider industry publications. So, you know, I mean, to be honest, the, the only ones that matter are the key trades when it comes to buyers. Um, 
uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, uh, our relationships mostly with uh, with distributors and and how we position. It. So, you know, to just to reformulate the questions, you know, do we hold films back from people like Miriam might hold a film back from um, from key press, and we might have to. But usually, traditionally, we'll start working on a film a lot earlier. So, you know, if we have a film in post production or development. Our, our work, you know, we'll pitch it to those who matter the most first in order not to upset people down the line. Uh, and that's a thing with um, with this film, you know, launching as open, you know, one, being a very good film, and two, launching in as open of ITFA, we had many, many, uh, you know, acquisition requests. And unfortunately, we have to hold back until we know what's uh, the best deal. And, and these days, the best deal is uh, a platform deal and we need world. So, you know, we do, we hold back other areas in order to try to, you know, really squeeze as much out of films potential as possible. Yeah, you check the big boxes first and, and then move on yeah. down the line. Moira, from a filmmaker's point of view, you know, your, your links are going out now to these first press. Um, tell us a little bit about that experience at CPH. What, you know, uh, how much do you think about or worry about uh, reviews? Do you read them? Not everyone does. Uh, if not, you know, I know some filmmakers mm -hmm. I work with just want to stay. Don't just tell me the good ones. Um, tell us a little bit from the filmmaker's perspective, especially with a film of, of this nature um, uh, in which you have so much personal investment. Yeah, it's weird because I know that nowadays the life of the film depends on the critics. Uh, so I was so scared that I asked Nguyen to read before me so I could, <laughs> can she send me, so she could send me after that and just say, okay, it's positive. <laughs> uh, and of course, I mean, I, that would be amazing if the critic would help you to understand the film you made, but normally it's not what happens because the way the industry is organized. Uh, so of course, the critics are super important. Uh, and like in terms of strategy, what we did is really like focusing on the, uh, focusing on the, on the media specialized for, like in the, in the industry. Also because we were planning the release later, uh, the release of the film, and then it's the time to go to, to a broader media. So yeah, but it's, it's, of course, I don't know, it's a very, it's a nightmare <laughs> to you read the, the first lines that are favorable. <laughs> it's a nightmare. And to some extent, you can control what happens prior to the festival in terms of who sees the film and, and focusing on your priorities. But at the festival, something else happens now. And even it's even different now with not having a sense of what's happening because it's all virtual. Who's watching it? Um, uh, since Ecstasy premiered first at CPH, what Tell us a little bit about the virtual premiere at CPH, this notion that it was kind of disappearing into people's laptops and you didn't know what was happening. What Did you get a sense of how the film was landing? How did that information come to you? Uh, how did it work with those first Q&As? Tell us a little bit about the experience of, of that virtual premiere. I'll start with you, Moira, and then Miriam, we can go to you from your perspective. Yeah, that was weird also because we had a very nice spot like on the theater and a very good time like at CPH Docs. Uh, and then like when CPH decided going, going online and we accepted uh, that was all the films at the same time, right? So I, I would never know when people would be watching the film and how, how they would be reacting. And that was also like overwhelming because this is a moment where you as a director learn so much about what you have made, right? Uh, what was nice about this film is that uh, we got uh, good reviews, and that was a first uh, feedback that I had, the first feedback that I had. And then people started writing me on Facebook and Instagram and telling like, and telling uh, that they, they were relating to the film and that the film really like made sense to them or sometimes like, oh, do you think that your, uh, do you see that your film can save lives? So we had, I had all these kinds of uh, feedbacks on my inbox on social social media. This and was your purse. These were your personal accounts, because as far as I can tell, you don't have any um, uh, uh, film pa pages for just the film itself. So they were writing to you on your personal accounts. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, we have a, a an Instagram for ecstasy. 
is that we are using the name always in Portuguese. Maybe that's why mm, you didn't okay. see that. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a small uh, social media, as Mujan told you. Like maybe nowadays, I would uh, I would put together a huge strategy of social media with festivals and also releasing the film right after the, the festival ends so we could cover each country. Uh, but we were in the beginning of the process and we would never imagine like, yeah, so we didn't do that. So that's something that I would do differently from what we did. Yeah, because it's really, I mean, the earlier you can start capturing and engaging with your audience in one place or a couple t platforms, probably the better. Miriam, uh, would your recommendation be to set up that digital infrastructure prior to the festival in, in most cases? And, and how do you typically do that? Definitely. And I think, yeah, as said before, I think now more than ever, um, because I think a lot of people, especially when you're watching a film online, what you're going to do is either look it up on Facebook or Instagram, um, or you're going to Google it. So you also have to make sure that you have your IMDb page in place, for example, because that's one of the first things to sort of pop up. And I think the more people actually watching it from their laptop, it's so easy if you're going through a program to just open another tab and just start Googling the film. So in that sense, it is more than ever important to have that online presence, as opposed to in the past, you would maybe sit down with the program booklet and just mm. go through it and see what you might like and uh, with the shift to digital. Um, and again, there you have the difference between, are you gonna target, be targeting audiences? Or are you gonna be targeting industry professionals and what kind of content do you create for each of those? groups as well. Uh, yes, uh, certainly. And um, did you do any marketing, digital marketing specific to, let's say, the, the Danish audience, especially around, let's say, um, mental health and eating disorders to try to generate some of that or uh, while you're premiering to see no, oh, is it, how is this film engaging with that particular audience? That's something I, I do. Did, did you do any of that here? Yeah, this is really an important focus. And I think like one of the things the film does, and there's a critic that wrote that, like he loves when films changes the, your view about a subject and ecstasy did that to me. And I think it, this film has a potential to add a lot of things to the discussion around anorexia and all the themes like uh, femininity, uh, mental health, body image, and et cetera. So, what we, we didn't because exactly we were planning an impact campaign and we are planning an impact campaign that goes together with the, the release of the film because like also what was happening that we were posting things and then people would write to us where can I watch and we would say you can't uh, <laughs> so it's really mm -hmm. maybe what I would do nowadays knowing the industry is like that is like anticipating the impact campaign and start that right after, I don't know, the second festival maybe, uh, and then well, release like the film in the countries as it goes up, goes on. But this is a really important point because I really made a film, I don't know, we, I think we are dreamers and we wanna change the world somehow. And, and we believe the films can do that. <laughs> uh, and of course, so this is the second step and we are planning to next year. Yeah, and I would suggest, and I know that resources and time, you're trying to finish with a film, but I would suggest in general for the impact kind of approach, that has to start really months before the festival premiere because you want to start uh, seeding that approach and, and, and building your partnerships and alliances uh, as you're premiering at a festival. It's hard to recreate that um, months later. And I know, I mean, but I also know that that you know takes resources and, and that it's uh, always a no, split. Absolutely. I totally it's agree always, with you. It's always mm -hmm. a split focus. Um, uh, Jan Rolfkamp is asking us uh, to talk a little bit about sales. And, and Xavier, I want to get back to you around the premiere and, and what actually happened with Nothing But The Sun. But more, let's talk a little bit about um, the sales infrastructure. It's a, it's, it is uh, a, 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 we perceive as a difficult film in, in the market. Um, uh, beyond the general marketing and, and, and trying to raise awareness with an audience, how how did you approach the sales and, and uh, maybe, and how did CPH uh, facilitate the, the sales aspect of, of launching the film? Uh, yeah, I think so like raising, about raising awareness about the subject and like trying to humanize also the subject and trying to tell people how it's related to them. Like how, like it seems such a, a distant uh, subject, but at the end of the day, it's, it's closer 
truer than we, what we imagine. Uh, and I think that is something. And also, like I don't know, I, I really I I participating on the release campaign of four films right now, and the extras is the fourth one. And I know how powerful is the way that you frame the film and how do you talk about the film to the audience. And uh, of course, it's a difficult film, but I, I I strongly believe that if we can talk about that subject, it might can make our relationships to ourselves and to the world better. And it's a film that talks about connecting to our bodies. That's one of the problems in my view that's going on right right now. Uh, did you get any feedback from sales? Did, did, what were the conversations like with distributors? How did, did you have any concrete discussions, any sales? Uh, so this is with Alexander because <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really like uh, with him doing that. So I, I, I wouldn't uh, step on this thing, but anyway. Uh, right. But it seems like we are just planning for the next years and trying to understand the bad, better way to release the film. Miriam, uh, how, in terms of CPH, they're, you know, quite heroically, uh, quickly, and I think quite effectively um, uh, went virtual. Uh, talk about that experience, what you had to change. Um, did you have a number of films there? How, you know, what were the different strategies? What kind of feedback were you getting uh, from? Because the feedback loop was disrupted uh, as well. So just talk about that first virtual experience at CPH. Well, I would say altogether, it was, as everybody said, it's very challenging, but I, I thought it was a very, um, a very positive experience as well, because it, because it was so new to everybody, it forced everybody to be really, really open and to really have open conversations. And that, that's what we did also with journalists and nobody really knew what was going to happen. And I really liked how open people were about it. So you, everybody had to admit that they really didn't know what they were doing and that they were just doing whichever they could. And I, I really enjoyed those conversations. And I think because it was going online so last minute, it was a relatively, I would say, normal campaign for us because we had already sort of planted that seeds and were already in touch with critics um, for review coverage. So, it was just a matter of, oh, so now that the journalists are not going to be attending the festival, is there still going to be coverage? So then we would talk to people um, at the different magazines if they were still um, going to be covering at all, if they were still going to be commissioned to do it, if they were not going to be on the ground. I think those were the major conversations we were having then. Yeah, and in and those early days, you had to make the decision. I know I did on a couple of films, that, including Zappa, that uh, we did. Um, that um, the journalists, the, the critics would only cover it if it was included in the virtual program. And, you know, we, for various reasons, we, of course, we didn't want to uh, be in the virtual program with a world premiere. We were same thing, what, how does this affect our sales, et cetera. And it was very difficult uh, to get, you know, to get any commitment for reviews unless you were in the virtual program, never mind that you were announced, et cetera. Uh, now it's yeah. different. Now, now, now we're seeing more coverage. Um, and, and, and luckily, also with Ecstasy, it was a film in the main competition. So I think if you're in a non-competitive section at a digital festival, it's going to be, it's definitely going to be more difficult because people, I think, especially by now, and that's maybe if you can compare the two campaigns, I think it takes a lot more convincing now for people to actually watch the films because everybody's getting a bit tired of just watching screeners. Oh, yeah, right. And I think back in March, people were still like, okay, um, it's a crazy time, but you know, we're just going to get our act together and we're just going to go for it. And that lasted a few months. And then sort of that second wave came, I would say sort of after Venice. In Venice, everybody was super positive because it was an actual festival. So we would actually... We were able to meet people and everybody was on a high and then that second wave happened and you could really feel within the industry that people are getting tired um, yeah this is so the big problem yeah. yeah i know myself i just wasn't watching 
uh, films for, you know, I was watching easy, easy comfort food on Netflix or whatever, you know, and I, I made myself a challenge to watch a documentary a day, at least uh, to, you know, uh, to see what was going on. I mean, it, it, it's been nice. The IFA, the, the docs for sale at IFA has been great. I've been watching one or two films a day and, and now I got to rush though. It's over on December 6th and, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I wish it was on longer if you're out there watching docs for sale folks. Um, and uh, the attention has been the hard part. Xavier, from the sales point of view, this would also be your challenge as well. And let's talk, I mean, it's still fresh. Mm. It's only, you know, nothing but the sun essentially only premiered, what, two weeks ago. How yeah. have those first sales conversations been going? Um, what kind of f feedback are you getting from the market? Are, are people watching the film? Are they getting it? Are they interested? <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of um, <laughs> different questions there. So I'm going to try just to pick a, a few. Um, you know, this whole uh, online markets and festivals, I call it online apathy. Uh, buyers are fed up and they're, they're skipping markets. They're not bothering. Um, you'll notice loads of festivals and markets are offering free buyer badges uh, to try to attract as many people as possible. But it's not really the same thing. Um, you know, on this whole discussion about uh, real uh, real cinema versus online, um, you know, in defense of online, um, I think uh, many journalists and buyers know how to watch a film online since uh, years and years and years. You know, they're professionals and we have to watch uh, Vimeos. And if, if a film can really, you know, give us the, the wow factor on, a, on an iPad, then we know in a cinema it's going to be unbelievable. So, you know, it's more difficult. Actually, I think it's, um, you know, when you screen in a, in a theater because you're consumed, of course, there's a whole uh, experiential uh, value, but, um, you know, you can wow an audience with a less good film in the theater. Um, so, you know, to really make it uh, perform well on Vimeo and get results means it's, you've got something really strong. But, um, you know, this year is definitely really difficult to get buyers' attention. You know, we can't uh, we can't call them up unless we have their mobile number. You know, which is a, a small thing. So calling up uh, broadcasters and let's say cold calling isn't something that's as easy. Um, we don't get the whole uh, word of mouth that might take place in the uh, you know in the Tuchinsky or whatever in the you know venues at Itfa. You know, and buyers will always be referring, I saw something good, I saw something terrible, I saw something that's not for me, but maybe it's for you. And we don't get that ability to talk to buyers on the spot. And, you know, it's a fast paced um, market. You know, films really outdate very, very quickly in, uh, in key markets in Berlin, Cannes, Venice, but also even in, uh, in ITFA. You know, you're pressed to get results very fast. Uh, before the announcement of the next big festival. Uh, you know, I, I always joke that uh, Berlin films die when Cannes announced their lineup a month and a half later. And, you know, years ago, and I think Jan can, uh, can support this, years ago we used to be able to sell a film for one year, from one, let's say, one Berlin to the next. Now it's, uh, it's one month. So we have to start the process ahead of time. And unfortunately, the documentary... It's, you know, it's, it's a different, uh, we mentioned this already, it's a different world, but, um, you know, uh, buyers try to commission projects. So if you, if you have a film finished, it's less ideal than something you can pitch to commissioning editors in advance. And having a feature that doesn't have a TV cut makes it even more difficult. And having a, let's say, a, a delicate film with cinematic value you know, it's not something you can flick through the TV and, and just switch on at any point. It really, actually, I say it needs the fiction buyers, it needs the fiction slots. And that's kind of maybe where our acquisitions come into play. We look for documentaries that can compete with the fiction titles. And it's a completely different profile of buyer. It's also more geared towards, you know, what we call theatrical buyers even though um, you know, they only represent a, a slim percentage of the overall uh, income. And you know, this year, again, um, theatrical sales are not something that's been booming. So with a film like um, Nothing But The Sun, we're riding on key selling points being environmental human rights, 
we know we're going to be doing fewer festivals, you know, which is less ideal when, you know, for example, if the, uh, I, I know many of the January, February festivals are canceled. So, you know, if we launch or have reduced lineups. So if we can't launch in, let's say, a festival in Sweden in January, it's a less of an opportunity to pitch to those buyers in Scandinavia and so on, so forth. Um, Okay, I want to but, come back uh, to you. I want to come back to you a little bit about uh, how you see this playing out over the next into 2021. Some mm. of your thinking, uh, uh, Mario, you had something to add to uh, Xavier's points. Yeah, just like because I think, of course, like artsy art, like these kind of films are hard to sell, and they, I, they, I feel they depend way more on impact campaigns than traditional films somehow, uh, and this is the, the challenge because. I think we need, you need to start fundraising for the, for the release of the film early in the process. And that is also challenging, like mm -hmm. from the point of view of, of the production. But that's it. I think I just feel with more independent films, we need to kind of build our audience and really like understand what are the places that like people want, like would connect with your film. Yeah, it's I agree. It's, it's it's a challenge at any time, but especially now when you don't have these events where there's a critical mass of people talking to each other and and, and amplifying very quickly uh, your goals. Um, Xavier, uh, Miriam, I want to come back to you in a moment. I want to get a little get back geeky and then get into some of the tools and tricks of the trade. How you know what kind of what kind of uh, email list do you use, et cetera, just to give some practical tech technical advice. But Xavier, I'm trying to think through with the films I'm working on, how is this gonna look through fall 2021? Is there, should we hold, uh, is, there a, is there gonna be a crazy number of productions on, on going to market in fall 2021 or even in spring 2021? Uh, how, what's your thinking looking like in terms of like the supply chain and, 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 and where you think there might be a sweet spot and, and how, how you're timing yeah. some of these strategies? Because I think that's what many of us who are doing this are trying to think through that. Uh, we know there, in one, in one hand, um, um, uh, many productions uh, have been halted. Uh, maybe there'll be a, a point at which there's a real, a real demand for more new content. Uh, but then there's going to be probably a, be a point where there's a there's a lot of a lot of productions coming to market at the same time. Well, how, what's your thinking uh, there? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, from um, I know from buyer point of view, many are saying we have, uh, and this is nothing new. They'll have a full lineup until uh, a fo the following year, if they've uh, pre-bought or bought on script or uh, some name, you know, projects. So you know, at the best of times, distributors are, are scheduling. 10 to 14 months in advance. And now they have the films from 2020, which they haven't released, plus the films that scheduled for release in 2021. So, you know, to, to sell films efficiently, you have to plan that a film is going to be launched you know, uh, maybe a year in advance. And that's, um, it's not a bad thing either because you'll be able to capitalize on many, many distributors scheduling a release at the same time. And obviously, you know, promotion is, uh, has no borders, especially online. Um, you know, there is, uh, I heard a month ago, you know, people used to say, oh, in, in a few months, there's going to be this huge uh, drought of, project, of films and uh, the platforms are gonna lap up everything because they'll be desperate for content. And, you know, I remember talking to one of the big platforms in April and they said, oh, you know, Zav, we've got over 300 films scheduled for release today. Too many already. We don't know when to schedule them. And we have X number, which will be completed. The post will be finished in time. So, you know, it's, it's a long wait. Uh, there are projects that were shot this year. There are loads that were not launched this year that were in post. Again, you know, films uh, that launch, uh, you know, might've been completed a year in advance. So, you know, especially in Europe, there are thousands of films waiting to be launched. It doesn't mean all of them are good, um, that there is a backlog. And, you know, at the same time, we don't have places to launch them festivals are cancelled or they they have smaller lineups um you know as you know with uh, with many of the festivals they're doing mini lineups of 50 films or only the competition uh, gothenburg announced recently they were only going to screen the competition and uh you know i i think that's maybe 35 films it's really 
not many. And you know, for films like this that rely on uh, on hype, you know, if you don't have uh, a key selling uh, name or talent attached or a famous director, it's not um, it's not going to fly off the shelf. You're not going to get pre-sales and the value of festivals, you know, is really important. And also, you know, the income from festivals to be really blunt for art house uh, fiction and documentary, you know, if you if your film is, is good and has a, a good launch festival and a seller, you know, they can represent maybe 50% of your overall income. And, uh, and that's a big, uh, you know, thing that's missing this year. But, you know, I also need yeah, to let's, that... let's stop. Let's stop there, though. I mean, I don't want to oh. get too in the weeds on, on this. And, yeah. uh, but uh, are you seeing revenues from the virtual festivals? Uh, we, we are. Yes and no. I mean, it's it sort of dried down at the very start. And then, um, you know, I've said this uh, publicly in a few articles. You know, some festivals have uh, have announced they've had the best box office historically ever. And my point of view is, well, if you have so many more viewers and so few costs, why aren't the screening fees going up? <laughs> yeah, so, I, know. I mean, uh, I've, I've been making the same argument on my end. And uh, yeah, our, you know, I, what's the revenue share look like? How, what's the reporting look like, et cetera? Yeah, sure, sure. There's not, um, you know, I, I, unfortunately, festivals offer the platform, the exclusive platform for the discussion and so, you know, historically, if you had a panel and festivals are talking about festivals, they'll only, only portray themselves as, you know, godsends, perfect, great, contributing to the wider industry. But that's not the narrative I hear from distributors. You know, mm -hmm. distributors share the income. Festivals remit, as, you know, to screen to as many people as possible and to an extent not pay and that's yeah, a it's a different it's a different panel uh but uh, oh, I, hear you. Sorry. I, I i no no i hear you and i, I could talk about these issues for uh, a while there's been i mean from the media space point of view a lot of coverage on the heroic efforts of festival organizers and putting on virtual events but for me that takes up space that could be devoted to promoting the films and and so uh I, there's a bit of, of a problem there but uh uh, again, that's a whole other issue. Let's get back to marketing. You know, we only have about 20, 15, 20 minutes left, but they're good points, Xavier. And I think a lot of us are, are discussing them, but more or less uh, uh, off camera. Um, 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 uh, Miriam, uh, so we only have about 20 minutes left. If there's questions coming through on Facebook or whatever, they'll be fed through to us here. And I'm happy to take uh, anything that we haven't covered so far around publicity and marketing. Uh, Miriam, let's get a little bit geeky. I know, uh, you know, this takes a lot of technology. What are the sort of tools of your trade? Do you use MailChimp? Do you use, you know, what's your, how do you organize your email? What are, how do you organize your social media campaigns, Hootsuite, et cetera? What are your sort of top sort of five tools of the trade and tricks of the trade that you're using in terms of getting everything together? Well, I think it's still sort of traditionally that my phone is still the most valuable thing that I use. Um, albeit not because I have all those apps on my phone as well, but it's, um, I think it all starts for us. Um, MailChimp is really important. So we send out our press releases through MailChimp also because it's very easy to tag certain journalists. So we have a whole network of journalists um, that are tagged in a certain way. So either related to a festival or of course the media that they write for or the sort of specific interest that they, um, that they have. Um, so we send that out through MailChimp usually, but I would say, I think also the biggest misconception is people think, oh, so I'm going to hire a PR agency. They're going to send out, send out a press release and that's when I'm going to have all the press and it doesn't work like, I mean, unless you have a really, really, really big name in the subject of your press release, but I would yeah, say. I mean, that's a good question. Let's just pause there. Most of the time, you probably don't do press releases. I mean, only, I mean, do you do a press release for every festival premiere? Uh, you know, you, you're, you can't, when does it make no. sense to do it and not to do a press release? I mean, a press release really makes sense if you have what we call hard news. So actually like facts that are new to the world. So for example, the moment Xavier signed Nothing But The Sun, 
that was, for example, a very big moment to release. So then we got in touch with um, Deadline, who then announced the fact that Film Republic boarded the it for opening film. So that is you give exclusive. You give exclu You give this news yeah. exclusively to one outlet yeah. or another. How do you choose? Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I always try to divide, and I, it depends a bit on kind of what kind of film it is, what kind of festival is it playing. Um, so what kind of deals does the festival have with certain media? But of course, you also want to get sort of coverage across the spectrum. And because we have contacts at so many media, um, it's also sometimes I think, oh, so I haven't done anything with variety in a while. Let's go to variety now or let's go to screen. But it also might be happening that screen will say, oh, we really, really like it. Um, but you know, in our editorial calendar, it just doesn't work this week. So if you want to go somewhere else with this, please do. Um, so it might depend on very practical things as well. But I would say if you don't have like a list stars in your film, getting that, that news out exclusively is always a good idea because it's going to guarantee you coverage. So at least like one of those major players um, we'll have it covered and you can do the same thing for your trailer for example so if you have a film in a certain competition or selected for a big, big festival um, it's always nice to have a trailer exclusive through one of the trades and of course for that we will send out a press release but I, usually for like the festival we will just send out our lineup um, of films to the press uh, and not individual press releases because if we People are going to see press release. They're going to be expecting, you know, something like breaking news. And the fact that your film has been selected for a festival, it's not breaking news because the festival probably just announced it. Um, so it's not really our job to announce that. It's more of our job to let the press know that we are handling that film. Um, Most festivals have their own, bigger festivals have their own press office. How much do you yeah. communicate and work with those press offices? A lot actually so it, it usually starts from the moment when we get the film confirmed where we reach out to the festival saying hi how's it going um, just to let you know we are representing these films also so they know if any requests come in they know who to refer it to and it's also good so that we will always be the central point of gathering all those requests so you don't have three four five different people sending out screeners for example so it all goes through me um, and then again, of course, you're going to need the press list of the festival at some point. For some festivals that is made publicly, uh, for some it's not. Sometimes the press department will give you a list. Sometimes they will give you email addresses. Nowadays, they mostly won't. So it really depends on the context that you have and the context that you've gathered. And from then on, once we've sent out that mailing, it's really all about that sort of personal follow-up so it's I have this sort of very simple list of let's say depending on the festival maybe like 20 30 names of people that I know really well that I trust and those are the people that I will start with so I will pitch certain films to them I will and then it really depends like some I know some journalists prefer email I know that there's some journalists that never reply to an email, but as soon as I send them a WhatsApp message, they always reply. Or with some, I communicate through my personal Facebook account. Um, so there are actually a lot of platforms that you use on um, communicating with journalists. And that's, your, and that's your bread and butter as a publicist. Your both your list, uh, which are more and more proprietary, uh, they're not as widely shared as they used to be. And of course, the personal relationships, and, and you can cut through some of the noise based on those relationships. Yeah, definitely. Mm. I think. Other uh, other uh, other tools that are essential to in your toolbox, uh, technological, uh, other things that you know. For instance, here's a small one. I've noticed more and more films having Wikipedia pages, which is, mm. is something that's newer to me. It comes up very high on the on the Google search. Um, um, you know, uh, what are other little technological tricks of the trade that you're finding are effective that you could share with us? Well, I think, I think still your IMDb page is still really important. Um, although that is often something that the producer does because often that page is already made during production. 
but actually keeping that page updated yeah. is really yeah. important. So really make sure that your poster is on there. Uh, make sure that the right synopsis is on there. Yeah. Um, and you can, and most, a lot of people don't know they can edit those pages, especially if they're in the credits, they go mm. too fast. And also like your production date, um, you know, for instance, if you're having a film now that you've been submitting to 2020 festivals and you haven't had any luck. And so maybe you're going to submit in 2021, change it to 2021. So it's a, it looks like a new production and not an old production. Sometimes these listings get up there and maybe the production date now is, is 2019 and you're submitting for festivals in 2021 change your production date to 2021 make sure your yeah. title is uh is right and yeah super important to manage your imdb page yeah can i, and, can and, I just add go ahead xavier yeah. yeah i just wanted to say you know one of the you know uh, assumptions that we say all press is good press and unfortunately that's not quite true if you have loads of really awful uh, rotten tomato listings or, or poor reviews it's not going to perform as well in sales and one of the advantages of working with a, a publicist is they'll know you know they'll know who likes what or you yeah. know informally have a chat and the advantage of a, of a journalist a reviewer saying i'm not going to publish because i won't say something nice is a huge advantage for a film and these Absolutely. are relationships that um you know like as a as a seller we have a little bit of those relationships we can't match what a publicist brings to a project. And, you know, you mentioned IMDb, uh, you know, many, I don't think in Europe it's as important, but North American distributors, Asian distributors, they ask, what's the rating? And you'll be in meetings in Hong Kong film market and they'll be checking the IMDb of every film on your lineup. Um, unfortunately, you know, sometimes you'll go on your IMDb page and you'll see a uh, five out of 10 average and the film hasn't actually launched yet. So yeah, there yeah. are all those people, you know, writing junk reviews. Um, but one thing is key. Uh, if, you if you start with a high rating, people will follow the flock. So all those hundreds of, uh, uh, you know, trolls, you know, rating and reviewing films that they haven't seen they will follow the trend. So if you have something that's positively, you know, in the, let's say seven, seven, eight, nine out of 10, they'll follow and start clicking seven, eight, nine. Yes, yes, it's true. It's really yeah. good. Um, you know, I mean, you want to know a secret of the trade. You can, uh, you can buy MDB ratings. Yeah. It's th yeah, $30, yeah. you get a hundred and it works. It really does work, especially yeah. for sales. I agree with that. And, and uh, another one is Rotten Tomatoes. Yep. And you have to get a certain threshold, I think eight reviews on there and you wait for that threshold and you hope you got a high number mm. uh, because it's a big, it's a big resource uh, and we all go to it. And then of course on the VOD, you get on Apple TV, you get the Rotten Tomatoes rating there. at the On bottom. Amazon, you get IMDb. And you get IMDb because they, yep. they own IMDb. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, more. I don't know if you you go and check your user ratings on your films, but I know my filmmakers do, and it's uh, a source of constant. <laughs> how do you protect, Miriam? How do you protect? Uh, what? How do you offset this sort of a negative launch? I've been, I frankly, you know, I've been watching the IFA films. For some of them, have come out earlier. I, I go on IMDb just to get more information about the production. I see the, you know, I watched one last night, and I was like, no, oh, I didn't really like this so much. Uh, I looked uh, on the I looked on the IMDb. It was uh, premiered at Venice. Oh, I see other people didn't like it that much either. Uh, it had uh, like a 5.6 or something like that. Uh, how do you mitigate that? Xavier gave us one hack. You you buy your way out of that problem. Um, what, how do you how do you think through those issues? Uh, isn't yeah. isn't one hack enough? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah. I, I leave that to uh, to Xavier. But I, you know, I'll, I'll I think. <laughs> No, I How think for, for us, we mostly want to sort of reach that really dedicated quality content. And of course, especially at a festival, if somebody has an accreditation, I can't stop anybody from watching the film or from reviewing the film if they really want to. But what I can do is really sort of nurture that contact with the people that do matter and the critics and I've had it happen where I really thought, okay, this film is going to be something for this specific critic. They watched the film. They called me and said, Miriam, I'm really sorry. I absolutely hated it. Um, so I'm just not going to review it because 
there's nothing in it for any one of us. So I'm very sorry, we're just not going to do it. And I think as Xavier mentioned as well, that's something like that's a step that you might not have if you don't have a publicist. So just knowing that, for example, somebody at Variety or IndieWire saw the film but didn't like it, that might be the reason why a review is not coming out. Um, I don't, I cannot influence it. I can't, I cannot say, well, then don't publish or uh, I only want that specific critic to review the film. Um, I don't have that influence. That's like the choice of the chief critic in the end. Um, but what you can do is really put, pitch it to the right people where they will say, and they will tell their editors, oh, I've, you know, I've, I've just received this brilliant film. Will you please let me review it? And that's what you're hoping for in the end. But I mean, you, can, you mm. cannot guarantee that people will put up the trash. I mean. Yeah, and of course the other thing with documentary and film criticism, these are film critics. And with documentary, you have the thing where they're reviewing the issue or the topic and maybe not the filmmaking crowd mm. Or, mm. Or, uh, or if it's an unsympathetic uh, character in your movie uh, you have maybe uh, a harder time with critics than if it's a sympathetic character, which has nothing to do with the craft and the form of the filmmaking. It's it's something uh, I look, I pay attention to. Uh, yeah, it's true. It's true. Um, yeah. Xavier, over to you. From the sales point of view, um, um, you know, you mentioned uh, lo you know them looking at IMDb ratings. What about how much equity, market equity, does a large social media following give a project? Do, are, are buyers more attentive to um, a production social media following if they have 10,000 followers on Facebook? Oh, okay, that's interesting to us. Do you have those discussions? Yeah, you know, I think um, the days where you, when you analyzed followers and then, you know, took the number, divided it in 10 and said, that's going to be your, uh, your DVD sales or whatever it was back in the day. Uh, those days are over. I really don't think um, distributors are, are paying attention. Plus, you know, unless it's like uh, nothing but the Sun's UK page, you know, specifically UK demographic. And then I could tell the distributor in, in the UK that uh, there's interest already. But realistically, it's not really going to affect anything. Of course, you don't want to have a page with only your friends and family. Um, so it's in your benefit to build up the, the followers, uh, especially that you get uh, preferential treatment on the platforms once you hit certain, certain thresholds to be listed on your you know, homepage, news feed, and, and uh, third party feeds. So um, you do want good activity, you do want good followers. I wouldn't say you should definitely not buy followers on, uh, on social media, it's, it's never a good idea, and I think people yeah. will notice. Um, but, you know, having an online presence is important. And, you know, anything these days that can drive eyeballs to your film, build up the awareness is good. So, you know, Facebook and Instagram are, are the biggest um, and they're very easy to, to implement, um, you know, targeted ads. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I will do targeted ads to our buyer lists or, you um, you know, for TV buyers, theatrical and festivals, if we have something newsworthy or a good, let's say a social media trailer, um, I will promote it and it'll help because if a buyer has seen a trailer two, three times, they'll know about it. And Miriam does the same with, uh, with press also, which is super useful. Um, they're not the only platforms though. You know, if you're gonna do a global campaign, they're good for Western European, North American territories and maybe Latin America, if you're doing uh, China, you know, uh, Weibo is, uh, is bigger. If you're doing Russia, VK is bigger. So mm -hmm. they're not the only ones, but they're, you know, they're cheap mm -hmm. to market and uh, it does work, but uh, standing out is a different story. And, you know, when you're just um, marketing B2B, finding good ways to, you know, to promote a film to buyers is a different story. And, um, you know, we've seen I, mean, that, I don't want to go into too many uh, examples, but you know there are some companies who've done some really interesting projects. They, they've gotten, uh, you know, for like serious, uh, less serious uh, fiction films, they've gotten the cast involved with yeah. uh, buyers, for example. Uh, there was a, a Russian uh, film market early in the year, and every day during their film market in the morning, they had uh, yoga with some super famous Russian uh, athlete, and then the next day was, you know, so they do things that engage 
buyers and seem fun. And, uh, you know, th this year has uh, seen little case studies that are good, but um, it's still difficult to stand out. Yeah, so, I mean, we're just scratching, obviously, the service. We got to wrap up soon here, too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so many, so many things to go into here. Um, I'll just sort of, uh, just to sort of, uh, Mara, what's ahead now for ecstasy through through the next months? We'll start to wrap up. We'll, well, we will be wrapping up. And, and uh, what are you uh, what are you what are you going to be focusing on over the next few months with with ecstasy? Yeah, we keep like on on festivals. We keep screening on festivals, and we are planning like this impact campaign with the release uh, for the second semester of two thousand twenty one. Right, we'll look out for that. Uh, Miriam, what does your next few months look like? How are you thinking about the festivals? Are you getting a lot of clients? Just, uh, just to wrap up. Yeah, so first I'm finishing my 10 days quarantine in Berlin after oh, right. coming You're back, back from Germany. Amsterdam. Yeah, um, and then um, I am just started talking to some teams for Rotterdam. So that's up next. Right, well, happy quarantining there. Uh, Xavier, same to you. What's your next market? Where are, you, where are you focusing your energies now? And what's next for Nothing But The Sun? Yeah, sure. Um, well, you know, we're working on uh, our lineup for the new year. Uh, so Rotterdam, Berlin, if it uh, happens. And um, Nothing But The Sun uh, will be offering Miriam uh, first to hand over an exclusive press release to uh, a trade to announce the first deals, hopefully in the coming few weeks. So that will be the next step. Well, we wish you well with that. And, and all of you, thank you so much for uh, taking our time to talk here to our IDF uh, audience. Uh, thank you to IDF uh, for, for hosting us here today. Um, I think I just going to say goodbye. I wish you all well and, and good luck with your own productions out there. And uh, be safe, be healthy. Uh, take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, Thanks, bye. everyone.